this is uh, uh, on behalf of my co-investigators from uh, Economic Medical Center in Amsterdam and uh, Boston Scientific uh, Engineers and the uh, development of an acute and chronic performance of communicating leadless antitachycardia pacemaker and subcutaneous implantable cardioverter defibrillator that is basically looking at uh, combining an LCP with an SICD in order to produce uh, ATP mechanism uh, in addition to pacing. Uh, so the rationale behind this is that ICD therapy uh, has many complications, not just uh, in the short term, but uh, over a long, long period of time. And when you continue to add leads, and I, I, I don't think it's any mystery why this abstract is uh, inclusive in this session, is because you've seen a lot of the, the mechanisms to try to deal with uh, chronic leads and multiple leads and things of this nature. So what we're trying to do is simplify the system. Uh, the main possibility to decrease the number of reoperations in the short period of time that a patient has this device in, or these devices modularly, and specifically try to decrease the surface area that leads to endocarditis that has such a high mortality rate at one year. So we've introduced the SICD for many years, and this is uh, increasing in linear uh, implant time, and almost at 25,000 implants worldwide. And the complication free rate remains uh, quite stable over the long period of time. And this is from uh, the pooled data, and this is even carries forward even further with the three-year data presented by Dr. Borsma uh, of the effortless registry uh, at HRS. So the application of the SIC is limited, however, due to the lack of pacing, and the capability for antitachycardia pacing seems to be an adoption issue, and people obviously have biases towards uh, one or the other. But uh, the consequence of trying to minimize the amount of hardware and simplify the system and decrease the insulation for patients who are at risk for ATP is obviously enticing to just about anybody in this room who deals with ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So uh, combining the implant uh, in a remote sense is really a step forward in the modularity of device therapy and the, the iterative process of managing patients with prescriptions that are actually designed to treat that patient based on their presentation and not give an all-type device to all patients who don't necessarily need that, and, but at the same time give a lot of confidence to implanters to select, say, an SICD because they have uh, a, a consequent patient who might, get an, uh, might have a ventricular tech carry that needs an ATP module. So when we look at this, uh, the next step is to really uh, create a method that looks at three specific objectives. One is uh, the LCP implantation itself and the functionality of such a device in animals. The device-to-device -device communication that's affiliated with this particular device uh, that's set up from a, a, a research standpoint to actually communicate with an SICD. And then make sure that the SICD, when communicating, doesn't inhibit therapy or identifies appropriate therapy to deliver ATP. And then the therapy itself, look at ATP, SIC, rhythm discrimination, and post-shock LCP function. Here are the systems, and also inclusive in this is a uh, new programmer that you see in the, the left corner there, which is a tablet-like system that actually has a, a module to link into as well. Uh, at the bedside, but they can be carried in a much lighter sense to the usual Zoom program. So the delivery system prototype isn't much different than what you've all uh, had experience with, with uh, LCPs uh, thus far with both Nanostim and with Macra or Micra, but the concept here is a, a little bit different and there are some proprietary things that I won't get into. The telescoping sheath is a little bit longer and the housing uh, a little bit longer than what you're used to with current systems. And the, and the leadless pacemaker system is not much different. The only difference is that it now can provide ATP. So not, it, it doesn't just treat bradyarrhythmias, but it also can treat tachyarrhythmias when it is notified to do such by the mothership, the uh, uh, SICD that's across the left ventricular uh, apex, or the right ventricular apex and dextrocardia. And so uh, the emblem PACE is, is a standard SICD lead with a prototype-based emblem that has the basic ASIC that is already in place in, in emblems that are being implanted today. So 
this type of a system would be uh, uh, backwards compatible with uh, the LCP. The, so you, any, any emblem that you're presenting uh, the patient with today might be able to do this once approved, uh, once, uh, and it's just a software change. It's unidirectional, so, and this is the first iteration of this particular combination of devices, but it's uh, unidirectional in a conductive communication method. So there's inductive methods such as you see with EBR, this is a conductive method of, uh, of communication. And a specific communication protocol had to be uh, created because uh, there are other ambient uh, RF uh, mechanisms in a lab and you can actually see it deliver ATP if you don't do something that's a little bit like dot dash dot. So we're getting back to Morse code here. Specifically when you look at, uh, okay good, it's plain. So you can see that uh, this is the delivery of the LCP and the first thing we did was an RV angiogram and now we're introducing a 21 French introducer. There's a delivery catheter uh, with the LCP housed in, in, in it. The telescoping sheet then it goes across in the animal. And there's a little bit more of a right angle uh, than you would see necessarily in the human model. We do another uh, little uh, Vino or RV gram right there and then we deploy the device. It's still tethered at this point and the housing is coming off. And then you can see it's not too different. Uh, it's like a combination a little bit of the micron and the nano stem. This is just a different uh, LEO type view to see that, that you're housed in an appropriate way. And you have to think of this because the communication has to have a, a dot, dot, dash to, to the A to the B. So it goes in sequence and it go, and sends two of these uh, communications across in order to ma maintain some degree of uh, uh, solidity and, and confidence in communication. And you put in an SICD successfully, and it's a little different in animal model, but uh, essentially you're, you're sandwiching the LCP between the, the coil and the can. So we uh, studied uh, three different uh, animal models. We had ovine, swine, and canine. The majority of the chronic data is in swine. Uh, the L LCP was positioned uh, majority in the apex uh, or the low septal area uh, or the high apex and then the alpha track in one patient just for functional assessment. And then uh, you can see that the pacing thresholds, the impedances, and the R waves are all relatively uh, stable. And this is acute. This is at, at the time of uh, implantation. And if we look at the long-term uh, progress of the, of the, of the animals, uh, specifically canines, at, at uh, 30 days, you can see that there's a nice stable run of uh, uh, thresholds and impedances uh, in the animals to date. This is the interesting part of this particular abstract, which is uh, the LCP shows a successful communication in three postures. So not just uh, an acute uh, supine posture communication where everything is hunky-dory in the animals and in uh, uh, anesthesia, but that we then take them in the chronic sense and we uh, get uh, threshold data. Now this is important because uh, if you are going up to seven volts in order to communicate, you're going to start getting some skeletal muscle in humans, uh, animals, uh, I'm not sure exactly what their sense is, but uh, uh, in humans we could probably hear a lot about that if they're going to get an ATP, it might send a little bit of a, maybe they'd stop the uh, DT before they actually got the, the communication. But nonetheless, the thresholds on the uh, LCP are uh, well within reason at two volts, and they're stable over time in three postures. Uh, because of this, the high success rate for device-to-device -device communication was seen in 309 uh, attempts, 306 were successful. Uh, and this is uh, really in the worst case scenario that we might see compared to a human model because the, the angle of the device is really uh, almost parallel to the to the uh, electrodes that you're communicating from, and so the consequence here is to angle things a little bit differently. And these are these are uh, studies that are ongoing for angulation, so that we can give you some guidance when you're implanting these on exactly how they should be sort of the most effective and and safe way of communicating. So specifically, we had a high ATP therapy success rate as well, 99%. So obviously, if it communicates, it's going to deliver ATP. And so the device is highly uh, motivated to deliver this uh, 
sequence of uh, beats at, at uh, 81 percent of the tachycardiocyclic, much like you would program ATP today on a transvenous lead system. So the mean number of ATPs per animal was eight, and uh, again, uh, the success rate was uh, really based on the communication success rate. This just uh, is demonstrating uh, the uh, functionality of uh, the, the device. You see the communication right there and the change in morphology with the ATP delivered. And right now we're just mimicking VT with pacing in the left ventricle as you see in the animal uh, model uh, x-ray to the right. And uh, once again, we're just gonna go through a full series just so you get a, a full understanding of what's happening. And the communication is quite stout. Uh, and uh, you can actually see capture on a high level. Uh, there's no dysfunction in the sensing consequent to the communication. So the device is still sensing and still delivering automatically in a series that you might see if you program on this series of ATP. And then just to be uh, uh, complete, we wanted to do uh, a shock to make sure that communication then occurred accurately after a shock and that the devices were impervious to this. And so that's what you saw here at the end. It was a counter shock to the animal through the SICD to determine it. And this is just stop pacing. So this was a, a mimicked uh, case of what we would naturally see in somebody. <coughs> so more importantly, the adequate SICD rhythm discrimination during LCP pacing is very uh, uh, distinct and you can see that uh, you, even with pacing uh, the device uh, can handle uh, the paced rhythm uh, transitioning from a sinus rhythm and uh, you don't get over sensing uh, at all through the device which is very important obviously as you're distinguishing between two devices that have this functionality. And then furthermore in the typical sense when we had dual devices and we we're putting them in and this is another uh, you know, going back to the future as it were where you basically are looking at high output device uh, pacing and uh, ventricular uh, fibrillation sensing and uh, counter therapy not being inhibited by the device or by the pacing. And then unaltered post-shock LCP performance acutely. So in the patients that are in the uh, animals that we did shock, uh, you can see that the baseline numbers uh, post-shock remain the same, including impedance and uh, threshold, which I think is uh, a, a new data set for this particular type of pacing. So these are numbers shock uh, two to three, and there were no dislocations uh, or device resets uh, of the ASIC uh, consequent to the shocks. So in conclusion, uh, LCP implantation uh, de delivered adequate VBI functionality, high implant success rate, device-to-device uh, -device communication, a very high rate of success in 99%. The therapy was very good and did not alter the function of either device in the module. And so adequate sensing during and adequate post-shock uh, function of the LCP and the SICD, and there were no dislodgements or problems from shocking the heart. So really, uh, just to uh, get to the, the meat of the issue, this is really the first foray of, of modular prescriptive therapy that I think is the future of the device. And you can see the SIC is a very powerful platform for this. So we're looking at uh, expanding this uh, and understanding better the histology and the acute and chronic implants. And then suboptimal device-to-device -device orientation in animal models, we're going to be doing a lot of mathematical assessment of angles so that we can get a, a very stout communicative process, maybe at a lower output than two volts. And then you can see modular therapy extending to an artificial intelligence type basis where you actually have, say, a cardio MEMS or a monitor of pressure inside the pulmonary artery that's measuring your hemodynamics and then delivering therapy at a time that it's necessary, just like we would at the bedside. And these types of communications and the ASICs involved have to be bidirectional moving forward. And that's one thing that I think uh, we've learned from this particular endeavor as well.